Hello and welcome back to Post-Exertional Mayonnaise Podcast. Um, we're sort of just coming to the end of our grief series and um, we've done sort of various interviews with people. Um, we've done, people have done written pieces that they've contributed and um, also people have given audio. Um, so if you're kind of just um, finding us now, uh, do go back and listen to some of those previous uh, episodes because they're really interesting and uh, I've enjoyed quite a few. Of the, I've enjoyed all of the discussions. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, I'm joined today by Emily Baselgate. Um, did I get your name right? Uh, no, it's Basil Jet. Sorry, <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have asked you beforehand. <laughs> no, it's very, it's very difficult to pronounce. So you did well. Basil Jet. Basil Jet. Yeah. Well, we've got it right now. So, um, yeah, um, Emily's recently sort of set up a uh, Substack uh, grief sick project um, and looking into the issue of chronic illness and grief in particular. Um, and it's it was just really interesting because we kind of found each other um, kind of as we were sort of doing similar projects in a way so um yeah thanks for joining us and um hopefully this will be a good episode to sort of finish our off our series but people can then sort of launch off and explore what you're doing as well so um do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and maybe your chronic illness history emily yeah um sure thing and dan i just wanted to say as well thank you for for the series that you've been doing on chronic illness grief because there's really nothing else out there you know mm. it's kind of grief sick and then your podcast so yeah I've just I've really enjoyed listening to all the stories so I just wanted to send you some appreciation for the work you're doing as well and um, in terms of me so I'm a chronic illness advocate a grief tender we can talk a little bit more about that later on probably I'm also an organizational designer and a coach and I've been sick with ME for eight over eight years my eight year anniversary illness anniversary was September And for me, like a lot of us, it started with a virus. So I was traveling in Vietnam in 2015 and I got bitten by maybe a mosquito, maybe a tick. It's kind of unclear. Mm. I was hospitalized when I was there um, and it really felt, you know, I had no awareness of chronic illness really at the time. And I just it just felt like an acute rather than a chronic illness story. And I'd been hospitalized and I came home and I was really unwell but it just sort of I didn't have any conception that this would (laughs) you know go on for forever and ever I took about six weeks off work um when I probably should have taken a year Mm. and um over the next two years I kind of lived in denial that I had actually I think if you would have known me then you wouldn't have known that I had ME um because I even like did I upped my exercise which was my passion so I was like lifting weights and like spin mm. class and all of that and I was back at my consulting job I was working like 60 hour weeks and I wasn't really coping but I kind of thought I was um because at the same time I was developing all of these like crazy immune systems and fungal infections and just like loads of kind of wild seemingly unrelated mm. symptoms and I'd go to the doctor and get like a pill or a cream or whatever and then you know no one was putting everything together and then in 2017 I got um just got sicker and sicker and my plan was that I would take like two months off work in 2018 and like in January and February and then I'd go back to work and I'd just be smashing it. And all I needed was two months rest and then I'd be fine. (laughs) And then everything just like completely fell apart in February of 2018. And I took, I ended up taking 10 months off work. And that was really the start of me really understanding that I had, I had ME, I had other chronic illnesses too, and that I had to change everything about the way that I lived um, in order to manage it. And I've got, I got a lot better over 2018, 2019 and 2020. Um, but I actually got the vaccine in March, 2021. Um, and I had a, a reaction to that. Um, so I'm personally very mm-hmm. pro-vaccine, but you know, it's, it's difficult when you have ME, you react to vaccine sometimes. So I've never actually got back to mm-hmm. the health I had before the vaccine. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. I, I, um, that's a side point, isn't it? But I, I sort of procrastinated about getting the vaccine because I'd heard so many other people's stories about having a bad experience with ME, um, and it wasn't. Yeah, like you said, I, I'm sort of pro-vaccine, but I, but I, I kind of 
partly didn't have the energy to just go and kind of do it but <laughs> get it done but I was just like I don't know about this I don't know about this and then just sort of like put it off to the fact that I just didn't have it get it in the end and I, I'm sort of like it's a difficult one isn't it because it, 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 I think you're in a no-win situation when it comes to that because you kind of know that there might be effects but then the impact of getting COVID and yeah it, it was a really difficult one and I'm quite isolated so it didn't kind of like um I'm we sort of live in the middle of nowhere so it's kind of I don't really see many people so it was just it was just the possibility of like family bringing it home and things but yeah it's I, I'm sorry that's happened to you it's um yeah. especially after you're having such a you know an, an improvement as well it's it's um it's tough isn't it it is tough yeah it's really difficult when you have an illness that is so under researched right because for some people vaccines are fine you know other people they're not fine um some people with long COVID have recovered from having the mm. vaccine. Um, we just don't know enough. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tough. So so you were thinking, sort of reading some of your sub stack, it's, it, it's clear that sort of like you were sort of like processing kind of your life in a way as you're going along and, 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 and thinking about it quite clearly in the in the context of grief. Do you want to tell us a bit about how, sort of the grief sick project came about and kind of like what what took it from just sort of you sort of exploring your personal feelings to feeling that you needed to kind of get it out there into something that was a much more significant project or something that was kind of quite public as well yeah it's a great question um so grief sick is an initiative to explore and bear witness to the grief of chronic illness and for me um i look at that in two ways so there's the griefs that we of, of the losses of chronic illness. So losses of relationships, abilities, passions, hobbies, and kind of imagined futures for ourselves. Um, I also, I'm very interested in the way that grief might impact on chronic illness through trauma, for example. Mm. And Grief Sick is, is currently a newsletter. I launched it in September of this year in 2023. And it's really an experimental place for me to work out loud around chronic illness grief because as we talked about there isn't really anything else out there that is that mm. offers this or that's exploring this or or taking this seriously so it's it's a place to experiment to kind of talk about what I'm reading to interview people to have guest contributions from other people that want to write about um, chronic illness grief and I came to this idea of working with chronic illness grief because really because it's what I needed. It's what I needed mm. five years ago and I didn't have. And, um, you know, it took me, I think, five years of being sick and, and a whole load of loss to realize that I was grieving. So mm. in 2018, in, in that year that I took 10 months off work, I lost a seven-year relationship, romantic relationship. I, I believed I had lost my career because I didn't know if I could ever work again. So I was kind of working with the belief that I might not be able to do mm. that. I had to kind of reckon with that. Um, I lost several other close relationships. I, I just wasn't there. Um, I lost exercise, um, which was my absolute passion. Um, I lost a lot of functionality, um, mobility, spontaneity. You know, the ability to be spontaneous is mm. really taken from you when you have ME. Um, and just a lot of losses. And they kind of all compounded with each other. And I felt really kind of lost and sad and raw about it um but no one said to me this is grief uh, you yeah. are grieving you know you have lost nearly everything <laughs> in a really short space of time mm -hmm. you know that is that's a big deal um and that grieving is a natural process which it is it's, it's part of life um i even you know i was actually in psychotherapy at the time and my psychotherapist was amazing and helped me with a lot of stuff but even she didn't frame it this way so someone mm. who's an expert in human emotions and in, in grieving process didn't frame it to me like this it was actually someone on twitter i think probably around like early 2020 who was talking about chronic illness the grief of chronic illness and that kind of blew my mind a little bit that you can grief isn't just about bereavement it's not just about grieving mm. a person it's also grieving um, other things and grieving yourself as a person right or the person that you thought you might be yeah. and those yeah. losses um so that was really transformational for me and then in terms of what took the idea from just oh i'm processing my own griefs to what if 
I launched something that was thinking about the collective grief of being chronically ill. It was actually a psychedelic experience that I had. Oh, wow. and, yeah, with psilocybin. Um, and during that experience, I had a vision of all of the chronically ill people around the world lying in their beds. And I felt yeah. all of our collective grief in a very profoundly embodied way. Um, and I was, I cried and I cried and I cried and it was super impactful. And it, it gave me this real sense of purpose and urgency to the work. And the idea mm -hmm. for Sick actually came to me a week later um, when I was resting actually, which mm -hmm. is quite a generative or creative state mm -hmm. for me. Um, so I've really been obsessed with the grief of chronic illness since. And I just don't understand why such a common experience, you know, 40% of the population has a chronic illness or a chronic condition. Um, it's, I think it's fair to assume that a really large proportion of that 40% will be experiencing grief or have experienced grief related to their chronic illness. And there's no, no academics study this, you know, there's no models, there's no frameworks, there's no books or podcasts or dramatizations or document documentaries of this experience that is affecting mm. nearly half the population. I, I, I don't understand why it's so hard for, for abled people to witness us in our grief. You know, why is it so minimized and not validated and not witnessed? Why is there no specialized support available? You know, you, you can't, it's, there are some therapists that, that talk about chronic illness and maybe some that talk about grief, but it's not really a discipline or a practice in its own right. And I'm really interested in how can we actually mourn these losses and how can we do that in a way that is safe for us because it's not always safe to access that depth of emotion that kind of the rawness of it um how can we do that safely and, and how can we do it accessibly as well because if you're chronically ill you also have a lot of needs around how you engage with emotions or support or services mm. so yeah a lot of questions and um mm. that i'm holding and not a lot of answers <laughs> it's yeah it's it is fascinating isn't it and it, it's like i know when i was start, we were sort of just i think um i think i we we i sort of came across this idea of doing this sort of series um because of something that somebody tweeted um um i don't think it'd be the same tweet but yeah it was it was a similar sort of um it was a similar thing around this kind of this idea of grieving and and i think it, it's almost like um like you said not aware that it's grief that the emotions that we're feeling or the things that we're going through but also um almost like for a lot of people not realizing that they can give themselves permission to grieve as well like like that this is what's going on and this is this is a really valid experience and i think like you said when i then start to think about this and then googling it there was just like very little at all if you just sort of type chronic illness grief into you know i think there was there was a useful American like um, site that had a, a, little, a social work site. I think that had a little bit on it, on it, and and there was very little else. I don't know if that's the nature of Google now that it's just kind of harder to find things. But um, like you say, the, the, there doesn't seem too much out there. So it's it's great that um, you're exploring it, and it, and it's fascinating that it kind of came out of this sort of experience that you had that it sounded like almost quite spiritual in a way so yeah it's um, <laughs> it's yeah it's interesting um what um what drew you to to launch the podcast series around chronic illness grief i think it was it was something um because we started the podcast in general back in um uh back in A april this year 2023 so um as we're recording uh and my friend dov and i who who sort of planned it out together and started it we we sort of we kind of just between us had a google docs list and and kind of like we're just just randomly putting things down as they came up in terms of ideas for like an episode um and it was and just sort of thinking oh where can we go next with it um and i thought okay let's look at this episode on grief but it was around the same time that i was thinking about that and then i saw this tweet so then i put another tweet out saying would people be interested in talking about this and it twitters or x or whatever is is a funny sort of place because sometimes you'll tweet something and then you'll get very little response and hardly anybody will see it and then on other occasions it'll just like blow up and this was one that i had like 
um, you know, thousands of people saw the tweet and then, and, and like dozens of people responded to say, yeah, they'd like to get involved. Um, and yeah, maybe had like, there was maybe like 20 or 30 people in them that said, oh yeah, I'd like to. And then in the end, it, you know, the nature of Twitter d- DMs and stuff like that, people not seeing them and things like that, it, it kind of whittled down to about eight or nine or 10 people that kind of came, said, yeah, I'd like to kind of come on to do an interview. And then other people said, I don't have the energy to come and do an interview, but can I write something or um, people, we had like six people that then like sent me recorded audio. So yeah, it was, it sort of like, it, it came from that, but it came from just thinking initially about the ideas of like, what, what are the things when we're talking about making meaning in life with ME and um, what are the things that impact us? So that, that was just a, a bullet point on a list really at the start. But, but I think it, it, it has, it's carried so much, um, and I'd love m- more people to see the, the episodes. Um, and, and it's hard, isn't it? Cause like, um, you don't always, it, it's like something that for a lot of people, you, you don't necessarily want to watch stuff like that either. It's, it's mm-hmm. hard because you've got to, it, it, it's very personal and it's also, um, you're addressing things that, that go right to the heart of your experience. And yeah, the, the physical, illness is one thing that we have to deal with but then we have to deal with the whole emotional side of it as well and and then there is that nature of emmy particularly having been stigmatized and and um even like going to like a psychotherapist or a therapist not really knowing what what their kind of attitude or view is going to be of chronic illness and and i had a, a a great um uh therapist who kind of saw me when I first became ill kind of and she gave me a really good reduced offer because she was kind of retiring and things and we we ended up talking about an awful lot of things that we had in common but that weren't necessarily related to disability or chronic illness um and that was really helpful for me but I I found um that she struggled to kind of get head around ME as a chronic illness and also um as a uh the central issue of post exertional malaise which and how that impacts you and the emo- the kind of the way that it is all encompassing in our lives and um for me you know she was a very positive person and and in the sense of like looking for ways to get better looking for kind of you know you've always got to strive to kind of look for for kind of different things to sort of help you and things like that and um for me i found that it was almost like the focus was so much on you know looking for improvement that i didn't have the space to kind of and, and one of the reasons i went was to deal with the trying to come to some sort form of form of acceptance to to recover from um not recover but find a form of acceptance to deal with the fact that i just like my life had fallen apart and my career had fallen apart and that i couldn't work and dealing with that and you know the whole idea of kind of being a provider for my family and all that sort of stuff so it was almost like I did that processing outside of therapy because the therapy wasn't the place that I could do it because I I was kind of like being encouraged to sort of look forward and I knew that I knew that you know the statistics of like 95 percent of people with me is it is that right don't recover or in adults mm-hmm. it's it's a five percent recovery rate. I, I know that's statistics, statistics been around for a while and it might be different because there might not be up-to-date research but but for me it was that 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 kind of that idea of like i need to i need to come to terms with this myself and and i think part of that was grieving and and um yeah it, it, like you said there's there's not there just isn't the resources out there and I don't think there's the real understanding amongst therapists of ME and actually how unique it is as a condition because of the the post-exertional malaise and that you're always you know you can't kind of think your way out of it you can't exercise your way out of it you can't you kind of do positive thinking or any of that sort of stuff it, it's it's having to sort of live in the middle ground isn't it of of the possibility that things might improve but at the same time um acknowledging that this could be my life for now and and that's that's hard and that is yeah um I didn't mean to go into sort of my my experience but I haven't actually yeah it's interesting that you asked me that because I haven't although we've kind of done this series I haven't kind of talked about my own experiences that much but um yeah it, it, it's having to find a way through it isn't it and and I think dealing with the, the grief and 
I think recognizing as well, and I, I'd be interested to know your views in terms of grief see, being seen as a almost like a process that comes to sort of a natural end point often. Um, not an end point because you never stop grieving for people that you've lo- loved that you've lost, but um, hopefully coming to a place of sort of um, resolution, I suppose, on on like somebody's death. But um, for us, it, it, it's it's like a constant living grief. And how how have you found that in terms of like some of your reading and and, and thinking about that in 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 the sense of like it, it's not a linear process, is it? And and that's difficult to deal with when you when you're living with something that is a constant grief isn't it yeah it's um I think chronic illness grief is interesting because because there's nothing that exists about it at the moment it's hard for me to like get a grasp on it and that's what grief is trying to do really like it's hard to see where the edges are and it's quite an oppositional relationship at the moment where I'm trying to kind of understand it through understanding what it isn't (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know it's not bereavement it's not climate grief um so what is it and I think um I mean I'm very fortunate not to have been significantly bereaved yet in my life Mm. so this is coming from um you know readings and things that that I've done but um I think I think with chronic illness grief so Francis Francis Weller is um, a therapist and a kind of philosopher. He calls himself a soul activist as well. Um, he's a he teaches um, and practices grief tending, and I'm training with him at the moment. And he says that chronically ill people live in the territory of erosion. Mm. Always a beautiful phrase, which is basically like a constant loss, <laughs> mm. you know, and a constant readjustment to like the geological foundations are always shifting always shrinking um and you know there's times where I might get better but then I'll get worse again and so there's this kind of constant like expansion contraction and I think that that is what is interesting I think to me about chronic illness grief that it is always changing and there's always like new losses that are emerging or losses that you're understanding because sometimes you might lose something, but not really understand you've lost it till a little Mm. while later. Um, And I think it's different to bereavement in that there isn't like a single, single shock, a single massive um, shock trauma, um, like the death of someone close to you where you are then you know completely tailspun into this world of grief and um are trying to process it and and live with that forever as you say because you never Mm. stop being someone um but chronic illness is like it it has it's more insidious you know it has this like this slow erosion um there isn't Mm. the griefs you might become chronically ill really quickly like i did because i got bitten by a mosquito or whatever um but the losses they're not it's not one moment in time it's lots and lots of little things that kind Mm. of erode over the course of your life really so that's one way that I'm looking at it at the moment um I think there's also something different for me in how people react to different types of grief and like how how it's sort of socialized in our culture Mm. I think with we're very like death avoidant and grief illiterate society Mm. Um, so I'm in no way saying that people who are bereaved get the support they need. They don't like, we know that. Mm. Um, and that's why there's been such an upswelling over the last couple of years, I think, particularly since the pandemic of books and, you know, death and grief is much more in the kind of, um, the cultural ether, I think, because of the pandemic Mm. because because we lack the skills to, to support people through that. So I'm not saying that people who are bereaved get what they need but I do think there is a cultural understanding that bereavement is a a shocking and traumatic experience and 
that even if people say the wrong thing or they avoid talking about it with the person who's bereaved, there is a, a respect there of some kind that this is a mm. transformational, a, a transformational experience. Um, one of life's big transformational experiences and chronic illness grief just doesn't have that. It has no language. Um, mm. You know, what's what's the word for chronic illness grief? You know, we have bereavement for the death of a person. We mm. don't have a word for chronic illness grief. Um, there's no language. There's no frameworks. There's no, beca and because of ableism as well, it, it's an experience that is, you know, being chronically ill is gaslit and minimized and grieving mm. while you, the fact that you're ill is also gaslit and minimized. So I think, yeah, there's also a bit of a, a difference, I think, in how those types of grief are are constructed in in our relationship mm. with each other. Mm. And it, it's interesting that when kind of doing this project that that we've we've done on on the podcast is that um, there have been like common themes, and one of the most common ones is loss of relationships, and that seems to be like universal for everybody that's kind of going through this. Um, and and yeah it's interesting to try and figure out kind of like well why have these relationships ended what what is it that 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 has meant that why do does society sort of like on on a whole with the ableism and everything what what is it that kind of leads to a rejection of people with chronic illness because on the on the I think probably for most people it, it's a case of rejection by the you know friends family um and, and loss of those friendships and um yeah like is that is that somehow linked to people's own, own feelings about mortality and i can't like people maybe about that like you said grief illiteracy and in, in the fact that people can't deal with it emotionally they can't deal with the the fact that you know changes in a person that they love but that um they 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 have to face up to, to their own kind of sense of this could happen to anybody and people don't like to kind of see that in themselves because we see ourselves as being kind of like um, strong or having to be strong within society, having to kind of like carry out roles, um, being a part of civilization or society is like central for so many people. And, and when they're faced with somebody that's... Um, that, that, that suddenly lost the capacity to be part of that... Um, is is there something there around kind of like this lack of acknowledgement somehow or a lack of empathy um yeah it's interesting isn't it and and it like you say it'd be fascinating to to kind of for there to be more research about you know loss of relationships and particularly in in chronicles and why that happens and yeah what's kind of behind that on a wider maybe like societal level yeah it's interesting um yeah, so you 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 were talking recently, and I thought it was a really nice analogy. And um, I think in one in one of your um, posts around um, a collective grief and and looking into maybe Celtic and Indigenous forms of grief practice and and a collective witnessing of grief, and it almost felt like this is kind of what we're doing on this podcast in a way that it's actually people. Um, kind of talking about their own experience and other people kind of like sitting and just listening and what's interesting is we 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 don't get a lot of feedback on on our on our videos and we don't get a lot of comments but I know that people are watching and it's it's interesting it's almost like a sense of a, a digital version of that do you, do you want to tell us a little bit more about kind of kind of your kind of findings around that and in, in your kind of like study yeah and I I think this is 100% what you're doing with this podcast I think you are collectively you're witnessing the collective grief and I think that's really beautiful and it's really needed. Um, so I've been training in grief tending um, and I just mm. want to say that I'm still training and I'm not an expert and I apologize in advance to my teachers if I misrepresent anything <laughs> on this podcast but I'm going to try and explain a little bit about what this is and why I think it's important and relevant to to chronic illness. So grief tending um, really just means consciously tending to our grief and bringing like a tenderness and a compassion to it, cultivating a relationship with our grief, becoming more literate in grief, um, and crucially doing this together in an act of collective witnessing. 
So what this tends to look like in practice is grief circles, which can be online or in person. And they are spaces where groups of people come together to do grief ritual together and to witness grief collectively. So grief historically, you know, grief was never meant to be carried alone. It's not meant to be this individualized sort of experience that's held within the boundaries of, of mm. us as individuals. It's, it's really a collective experience. Um, <clears throat> it's meant to be witnessed um, and we're meant to grieve together. That, that's how it works. Um, and grief tending is also not about pathologizing grief. So I think the American, um, I forget what it's called, but there's like an American kind of um, textbook for psychiatric disorders. And oh, yeah. recently grief has been added as like prolonged grief has been added as a psych, as a, as a psychiatric disorder that, you know, needs mm. treating with, um, with pharmaceuticals. And that's just such an interesting approach to such a human experience and human emotion that's common to to turn it into a, a medical condition um so grief tending takes the opposite view that grief doesn't need fixing or or making it better like you know the way that your therapist was approaching it before like it that that isn't needed with grief there is no solution grief it's not mm. a problem to be solved it's just there and it just needs to be it needs to be witnessed um, and supported to be metabolized and processed, but but not sort of fixed or, or sent away. Mm. Um, grief tending is also a practice that makes space for for all griefs. So bereavement, yes, um, but also climate grief, the breakdown of relationships, chronic illness grief, the state of the world. You know, for mm. me, what's happening in Gaza is very present grief that I bring to grief circles at the moment. You know, all of these griefs are welcome. Um, and grief tending has a very rich lineage. So um, really in the West, it, it was taught in the West by um, Subonfu and Maladoma Some, who are, um, belong to the Dagara people of um, Burkina Faso. Um, and mm -hmm. they bought in the 80s, I think, they bought their grief rituals um, from their um, people to the West because they saw what was happening in the West and the kind of the loss of, the spirituality, um, the loss of connection, the isolation, um, everything that's really been happening in our societies over the, the 20th century. Mm. And they believed that what had gone wrong is that we'd lost the ability to grieve. They, they saw that as the root cause of, of mm. our kind of our issues, our societal issues in the West. And um, they trained a lot of teachers in the West, including my teachers, Sophie Banks and Jeremy Threz. Um, there's also Maeve Gavin, who has taught as well, and Frances Weller, who I'm currently training with in the US, Martin Prechtel and um, Joanna Macy are also teachers that have really influenced everyone working in this community. Um, so hopefully that gives a bit of an explanation as to, to what grief tending is, and um, mm. I can talk a little bit more about it if that would be helpful as well. Yeah, it, I think I think that really makes a lot of sense in 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 that yeah like you said societies become more individualistic and more personalized and more you know literally people carrying around things called iphones it's like you know the sort of like the sort of the the, the nature of kind of like it's it's about me it's about you know kind of like um and i think there is that loss of that sort of collective sense of um unity within society generally you know across the western world and and, and i think that's yeah it's 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 interesting um but yet within chronic illness communities there is this sort of sense of um togetherness somehow online in an online community so it's 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 how we yeah look to kind of tap into those things to to support each other it's yeah it's it's important um yeah i mean if there's any are there other are there other sort of aspects of grief or research that you've kind of like found that maybe you've been able to like adapt for chronic illness or um not really I mean I think <clears throat> most of the grief models that exist that I've come across are bereavement models um and mm. they don't quite work um so for example um there's a model ah uh, the name's gone out of my head because of my Emmy brain, um, <laughs> but it's really a week. Maybe we can put the link in the yeah. the, sh the show notes. Um, but it's really a, it's a model that's um, 
become quite popular in recent years around bereavement grief. And it's about um, that you, when you become bereaved, um, you know, the grief takes takes over your life. It, it's all consuming. And then over time, you grow around your grief. So it's not that the grief, the ball of grief gets smaller or disappears. The gr- ball of grief stays the same, like it's still there mm. in its form. But you as a person expand, you learn to expand around it and you learn to create kind of space for yourself and your grief and to live mm. with both. Um, and that is kind of problematic model for chronic mm. illness because as we've talked about, we live in the territory of erosion. So mm. our lives don't tend to expand. <laughs> um, mm. So there's something for me about um, that model doesn't really, like for me, that doesn't really work for chronic illness. And I haven't really found a model that works for chronic illness. I, I, think, mm. I think someone's going to have to create it. Um, I think there needs mm. to be like a bunch of research done um, funded, of course, to to research and understand what chronic illness grief is, um, mm. and someone needs to do that. Um, and then, you know, we'll have we'll have the understanding, we'll have the models that work. But Francis Weller, who I mentioned, um, is one of my teachers who I'm training with. He has the five greats of grief framework, which I think is very helpful and does, you know, chronic illness grief does fit into that. And it's a, it's one of, I think, the most helpful kind of grief frameworks out there just because it gives permission for so many types of grief. So mm. I'll just, I'll run through the, the gates quickly, yeah. but the first gate is everything we love, we will lose, which we, we we kind of intuitively know is is true right whether that's it feels people. bleak to say it though doesn't it, it does feel bleak. yeah it does feel bleak but it's true and, yeah. and grief is the price we pay for love yeah. second gate is the places that have not known love so the places within myself that haven't known love which is a again yeah like a, a hard grief to hold a hard grief to access hmm. and the third gate is the sorrows of the world so, you know, that could be what's happening, the destruction, ecological destruction for me, you know, Gaza, very present for me at the moment. Um, the fourth gate is what we expected and did not receive, which I think is quite relevant also for, for chronic illness, right? Mm. Like what we thought our lives would be and what, mm. they can't, what they are, like the gap between those two things is where the grief sits. Mm. Um, the fifth gate is ancestral grief. So this is the grief from that's been handed down to us um, from people in the past, um, whether that's literally our own family or, you know, our culture, our society more mm. broadly. And then um, there's quite often this, so those are the five core gates. And then there's quite often a sixth gate and there's two, two different sixth gates, depending on who you talk to. But Francis has trauma as a, an optional sixth gate, which again, I think very relevant for chronic illness. And then Sophie Banks, who's my other teacher, has um, a gate for the harm I have done to myself and to others, which I think is also a really kind of rich, knotty um, mm. gate to access. Um, I mean, I, I feel that for chronic illness as well. Like the I grieve for for the self that didn't know that she was ill, didn't want to accept that she was ill and is more ill because of that. Like I have done harm to myself as a chronically Mm. ill person through not accepting that I'm sick Um, Mm. and the harm we've done to others as well. And I think that's a really helpful lens because often in grief, we can be so inward and we can enter quite a a victim type state. Um, And it's quite useful, I think, to be reminded that, we also we also have an effect on other people around us and it's not always positive mm. um, and we can grieve how we've behaved with others how we've harmed others too mm. so I, I think that's quite a useful model but you know you can see it's not chronic illness specific but it's the gates are broad enough that you can see your chronic illness grief in quite a few of them mm. yeah yeah and definitely the impact on others yeah and and feeling that sense of responsibility as well for the people that then you can't fulfill then causes a, a lot. You know, that was something I had to kind of really work through for myself. Like when I first became ill, cause it's like, well, yeah, like, you know, 
the the manner the house provides and works and all that sort of stuff and you know having to kind of deconstruct all those societal kind of like you know and, and coming from a social work background I thought I'd kind of like you know I thought okay I've, I've grasped feminism and I'm, you know I'm not I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of like a you know uh open to to, to new ways of things and I realized I actually know like I, I still carried a lot of those sort of societal um uh what's the word I'm looking for the word now um norms I suppose um mm. that, that then then we have to kind of like process as well to grieve yeah to to grieve yeah um do you think is is like acceptance something that's important to you in in grieving have you have you found that you can you know in terms of I think it's the Kubler-Ross model that you kind of like work through these stages and then kind of like come to a place of acceptance and then maybe go back to kind of like anger and all that sort of stuff but is 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 acceptance something that comes naturally to you or is that is that something you kind of struggle with or is it important to you I don't know um I really have a contentious relationship with it um I'm not a naturally patient person um and I have a lot of like fight in me Mm. (laughs) and it's I it's hard for me to accept accepting um and so I feel like I live in this constant zone of tension (laughs) between um acceptance or tolerance I think you've talked about tolerance right Mm. um I like, I like tolerance. Uh, I think certainly for me, my life got a lot better and easier once I truly understood and I suppose tolerated the fact that I have Emmy and I would Mm. need to change everything because until that, if you stay fighting, you can't ever really get to a useful place sort of psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, I don't mm. think. Um, but it, it really takes time. Like I got a new diagnosis earlier this year and I am fighting it. Like I am, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, 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 it's intolerable. It's literally, it's intolerable to me to accept that I, that I have this, there's nothing I can do. Da, da, da. Like I, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm really still fighting it. And, and I know logically that, nothing will improve for me until I get to that point of tolerance, but I can't, (laughs) but there's something for me, I think also around, um, I mean, this might be a bit of a a confronting word for some people, but I, I quite, I quite like surrender. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know that that's even more extreme than acceptance, but, um, like I, I only learned to rest properly when I decided to work, to work with surrender, to, to embody the experience of surrendering to, Mm. to, to my body essentially. And Mm. that was, that was in 2021. I picked every, at the beginning of every year, I pick a word to like explore and learn about and embody in that year. And I picked surrender for 2021. And it was, mm. uh, yeah, that was the year that I learned to rest. So I, I, I feel like I flip between these states all the time. You yeah. know, I've got, I've got tolerance of ME. I, I won't accept my new diagnosis. <laughs> I've got, you know, it, there's, I, I can't, I can't accept not, I can't accept that I might never um, go climbing or ride my bike again. Like I can't, that's not acceptable to me. Mm. Um, I can, I can. I feel like I can, I can put my, if I, I need to keep my time frame short, <laughs> I think, you know, yeah. like I, I can tolerate, I can tolerate it for two years. I'm like, okay, yeah. two, two years of tolerance of that. And then in two years time, I'll pick two years again and it will continue yeah. in that way. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. That the word surrender is such a, it, it is a loaded word. Um, but I quite like it because um, I wrote a song about eighteen months ago, and I recorded it. I put it on YouTube, so I might put the link in. But that—that's 
I think the first few lines were like, "This isn't a race; it's a, it isn't a battle," and and um, and surrendering is the only way that any of us can win, in a sense. So, like for me, that that is quite a a useful word. Um, not, but it, but like you say, we're sort of like living in this like in between sort of like tension because if 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 you, I think I think there's an element of surrendering that isn't giving up. It's like it's it's having to surrender to survive in a way and 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 it's not surrendering to say like i've given up on life because somehow we have to keep going so it's like it's 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 a really difficult one isn't it and and that's the tension with grief that it's it's not um an easy process because we sort of do we sort of do live in this kind of like um state of being that 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 we could see some improvement and like you know, at some point we could have treatments or some of us do spontaneously kind of start and recover um, or, or get to a place that we're in a better state where, you know, you might be able to ride your bike at some point. But, but it, 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 like, it's, it, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but it, it, it's hard, isn't it? It's it's kind of like it, it's being in this in-between that's not, that, that that's not, not accepting, but it's accept tolerating maybe at the same time where where we're sort of like in in this sort of like land of patience i suppose we're having to yeah but at the same time i, I like the that that term around erosion but also um i think i included in a song about um the word entropy because it does feel like as the longer time goes on the longer the the more our bodies are failing like i often think like um like not having any exercise, like my, my muscles, my legs look like pins, you know what I mean? I've lit- literally sort of like wasting away, but also putting on weight at the same time, which is not a good combination, but it, it and then you think, oh, about your heart and, you know, all those sort of things that, that, that from a sort of physiological point of view, I'm thinking like, okay, I've, I've been living with this for six years now. Like how is my body being impacted by this condition on a, on a longer term scale? And I think, I think like you say, it's, it's trying not to kind of like, look too far ahead because it's quite bleak in that sense and that's part of the grieving process as well it's almost like grieving for the future you can't have <laughs> in a way yeah. yeah and I think like it kind of comes to me comes back to um that thing of how disabled people and chronically ill people experience time is is so different right mm. so um Ellen Samuels has this great article that she wrote about crip time and how we experience time so differently like it's not really linear and it's it can be cyclical it's it's really quite fluid um and that a day doesn't mean the same thing and that you know for us in particular like with PEM with post-exertional malaise you know the day that you're in in terms of your energy and like the day isn't the day right like the day mm. is what happened two days ago or yeah. what you did a week ago or a month ago. And it's then like you're time all, traveling. <laughs> it's time travel. We like, yeah, we are like energy time travelers. And you know, it's also it's all the day is also what's happening tomorrow, what's happening next week, what do I need to save energy for? So we're mm. kind of we live in like a, a sort of temporal um place that's very different, I think, to to healthy people. And um that yeah, like you, uh, yeah, I, 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 I really live in the short term. I live, <laughs> I really live in the present and kind of up to about a year out is kind of as far mm. as I will, pl- will plan. I mean, I don't really plan mm. anything to be honest, but like it's, it's as far as I'll go in terms of the future because yeah, it's hard to go further than that. I, of course, I, I also worry about, I worry about my heart. I worry about all the things, the, the bodily systems that aren't, functioning right and aren't getting what they need because I can't move as you know so I think um and that thing of like only thinking a year out for me the working with seasons really helps because it's yeah, it's always a never ending cycle right mm. never ending cycle yearly cycle of like a four seasons and um just so we're in winter now I can think ahead maybe to winter next year and that's all I need to because then the cycle will start again. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think the seasons is 
it's helpful but it 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 is weird in another sense because like um like i don't take many photos now because there's not a lot to you know when you don't have a life much <laughs> beyond the sort of like your sort of four walls and and your sort of front door or whatever but um i i do take photos out because i live in in the countryside you know i take photos of the trees and the, you know the scene outside my front door but um seeing the seasons change it almost like looking back on your phone and you're in the season that you're in, but then you kind of look at photo, you know, photos from a few months ago, and it's like, oh, it's summer then. But it, but it almost seems like it all sort of blends into one, doesn't it? When you're living quite a solitary life, that um, that that it, it's a bit of a blur, and you think, oh, this year's gone by. What's happened? And like, I can, I can probably like pinpoint like three or four things that I've done this year, like that have actually that I've actually been anywhere or kind of done anything that, that, of, of memory, but uh, of, that's memorable. But at the same time, you know, something that I did like sort of, I went out for a meal with my wife and that was probably like the beginning of October, but it doesn't feel like that long ago, but it was, you know, it was coming up three months ago sort of thing. And it's like, um, and you think, well, yeah. And those, those things that kind of like um, somebody might do and then, you know, a healthy person, you know, forget that they did it like three weeks later. But for us, it's like those things that do make meaning in our lives hold so much more weight, even though they seem like quite small things to others. Um, definitely. It's it's an interesting process, isn't it? Um, have you, is there anything else that you'd want to share that you're thinking about or around this subject of grief before we finish? Um, yeah, I think what... I would find helpful to share I think is that um which I didn't say earlier was I think part of the reason I think it's really important to do this collective witnessing of grief as you're doing with this podcast and I'm doing with grief sick and hopefully in the future with um withholding grief circles as well is I really think that um grief if if you're given the right support to access it at the right time for you in the right ways, safely, um, I think grief is one of these states that are that that is potentially really transformative and has a lot mm. of. Um, I mean, grief tenders talk about it having. Francis Weller talks about it having like an alchemical alchemical power. You know, like an ability to transform to take raw materials and turn them into something else and I think that's very that's an anathema to to our society and the way that we work and the grief illiteracy that we have but I really think that if more of us were supported to access our grief in in the right ways in healthy ways um I think it has it could have a real transformative power and that's certainly what I have found for myself mm. I'm not saying that it will work this way for everyone but I have found through being in much deeper conversation and relationship with my grief over the past two years I have had much I've had much greater access to to intimacy to joy to all the things that make that make life worth living um even even with my illness even with my limitations you know mm. so i'm not i'm in no way saying that grief like heals illness or i yeah. anything like that not at all <laughs> but i think there's potentially emotional or or spiritual healing that could be available to us if we mm. were supported mm. in the right way to to access this so mm. that's something i'm very interested in and passionate about as well yeah and definitely in, uh, if i find that if i'm in a better place sort of psychologically that actually it makes managing the illness much better than if i'm in a really dark place yeah and and i think processing that and like for me it's been really interesting going on this journey and 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 exploring this subject with the podcast because it's it's made me think a lot about kind of yeah how how it's impacted me and the the loss that i experienced you know through um not being at work or just not you know not being a person in society in the same way and and um yeah I, I definitely think it's been it's been really helpful and I, I really hope it's been helpful for people listening and um and 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 sort of taking part and uh yeah and I'd really advise people to kind of like um 
you can subscribe to your uh, Substack, can't you? And I'll put a link in the um, comments. Um, and it'd be really good for people to get involved and to 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 learn more through that. And and you've done like a load of reading, and there's um, there's a really good page that's got like stacks of resources in terms of like stuff that you've been looking into. So like that in itself, I think it'll be really helpful to people. So we'll we'll make sure we get a link to that as well. Um, so yeah, and and maybe uh, maybe talk further in in the future as well. Um, so. Um, yeah, and it'd be really good to promote promote your um, your grief circle stuff as and when that 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 kind of happens as well. So, um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really good to talk, and um, and yeah, it's uh, I never know how to end. <laughs> so, so <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thanks for thanks for your time. Well, thank you, Dan, and um, yeah, really appreciate the work that you're doing around this as well. And I've really loved our conversation. Thank you for having me. It's it's been good. Thanks. <laughs>